composition without, uh, without just getting to make up a convenient semantic function. So let's look. This is where it gets a little interesting. <clears throat> so here's a specification. There are going to be two of them. Uh, this is what we said, the meaning of the thing I call identity in my API has got to be the identity function, linear function. And the meaning of what I call composition is actually composition of the meanings, composition of honest and linear maps. So now using this specification, I can calculate the correct implementation, the correct by construction. And here's how I do it. I'm going to work from right to left. So the id on the right-hand side, this is identity for linear maps, not the data type of the mathematical values. <coughs> okay. So what I want to do is I'm solving. So here are two equations. Another equation is the meaning of the semantic function, and I'm solving that system of, of equations for two unknowns. Well, there were three, scale, id, hat, and compose hat. Okay, that's the idea. When I solve those equations, I'll have a correct implementation. So here we do. I take id, I want to massage it toward the form where it's new of something. So id, id we know what that is, that's lambda xx, which is equal to lambda x1 times x. Okay. Now this should be obvious, except maybe for why I'm bothering to do it, but it's because I'm working toward this point here, which is lambda x1 times x, oh, that is equal to the meaning of scale of 1. How do I know that? I go back and look at the definition of mu, the meaning function. Okay. Lambda x s times x, here I have lambda x1 times x. All right, so I've just calculated a correct by construction uh, implementation of it hat. Now let's do composition. A little trick here, but not a whole lot. So um, I'm going to start with the right-hand side again. Meaning of G composed with the meaning of F. Well, G and F, they're only one constructor for this data type so far. So I know G has to be of the form scale something, and F does too. So I'll let G be scale of S and F be scale of S prime. Okay. Well, now I know what I know what the meaning function is. I defined it previously, so I'll just inline it here. And then I can do a little simplification. I'll compose these two functions, and I get lambda x prime s times, that's the s times, and then this x becomes s prime times x prime. Okay. Just a little bit of equation reasoning. And I'm use associativity multiplication. It's critically important. So I'll reassociate to this form, and I, then I say, oh, that looks like the meaning of scale of something. I go back and look at the definition of the meaning of scale, it's this. And I say, oh, that looks like that. So this guy is equal to the meaning of scale of S times S prime. Okay? So now we're almost there. We're just like a hair's breadth away. Now the question is, how can I define id hat? All right? So that the meaning of id hat equals id. Well, I know that the meaning of scale 1 equals id. So I'm going to let id, id hat be scale of 1. Okay? This isn't just lucky, of course. I was working in this direction. Similarly here. Uh, what can I choose for compose hat so that this equation is true? Well, I set it up to make it quite obvious to me. I should choose uh, compose hat uh, to be this, scale of s times s prime. Okay? So the derivation, the reason was sort of top down, the proof, you know, if you want to sort of verify this bottom up. How do I know that, that these definitions satisfy the specs? Just Read this slide from the bottom of the top. So that's an example. You have a precise specification. You have nothing to do with the implementation. I made a guess about hmm, what might be a good representation. All right, I've got some experience with this sort of thing. I have a little foresight. Uh, and then I work through and derive the implementations of, uh, in this case, identity and composition. Questions? So it seems like the goal was to solve these equations in terms of the representation. <coughs> Is that one way to say it? So, John says it. So, it was the goal to solve the equations in terms of the representation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I'm working with the representation, I have a semantic function. So, if you pick a different representation and you couldn't do it, it would be bad. Yeah, well, no, it would be good. So, so, I said, so if I pick yeah, a different representation and I fail, would that be bad? Um, not that I was ego invested or something, maybe. It might be a little painful. But no, I would look at, I'd look at the difficulty I ran into and I'd use it to give feedback about making a better choice the next time, and I keep doing it until I get it. What if I was lazy? I was just like, well, it equals it. Where did I go wrong there? Uh, well, it doesn't equal it. All right. So that's right. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, they have different times, right? I mean, the id hat can't equal id, they have different times. One is a linear map representation, the other is mathematical. Linear map. But I might, I, mean, I, might be I might be missing your question, I'm not sure. So, no, I mean, I don't think you are. I mean, I'm, just, I'm just trying to uh, get sort of a, I mean, because if you just put it in there, it's going to have the equation, you know, it a. I'm thinking of the Haskell function it. Oh, well, the Haskell function it has the wrong type. That wouldn't even type check. <laughs> ah, a not typed Haskell program is not even wrong, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. So yeah, you wouldn't be wrong. Perfect. <laughs> 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 you wouldn't be right. Okay. All right. So, so there, there we've done a derivation. Now I'm going to move to the, to the sort of next aspect, which is to use algebraic abstractions, and hope that I can give you uh, some incentive for why you want to do that. So what do I mean by using algebraic abstraction? I mean to use standard vocabulary and set of laws that go along with those, those vocabulary. And we get a lot of leverage. It's both design feedback, as I mentioned, and um, it also lets me leverage the uh, ecosystem that supports um, me as a library designer and my users. Uh, I get to uh, use the, the support for those abstractions. So what's the idea? If we have an ad hoc uh, vocabulary, we want to replace it with a standard abstraction. Okay. Now, the semantic, so I gave you um, my uh, specification, the semantic um, uh, requirements turn out to be of a very particular form, uh, which was exciting to me to discover. And those forms are exactly this thing called homomorphism, and I'll show you what that means. Um, and then the last step is, well, it's optional. The last step is to notice that the laws hold, not to find out if they hold, it's just to notice because they do hold necessarily by the uh, discipline. All right, so here's the question. What standard abstraction might I want to use for this type of uh, linear maps? Any thoughts? So, in other words, uh, this data type, linear transformations from A to B, might be an instance of what standard abstractions? So, I'll rattle off some examples. Uh, monoids, and the mappy ones, groups, rings, fields, so on. Uh, functor, applicative, monad. Uh, traversable, foldable. Hmm? Category. Category. I think I would get in trouble if I came here and talked about category theory. <coughs> but in fact, the answer is category. Okay. Now I'm not going to talk about category theory, but I'm going to talk about category practice. Okay. <laughs> so, not theory, it's practice. <laughs> of course, if we ignore theory, we get practice wrong. But. Uh, um, <laughs> but I'm not going to throw anything hard. So, yeah, absolutely, category. So, category uh, is, uh, it's not scary, it's just uh, a Haskell class. It's actually a very simple one. It's in control.category. And, and this is the interface here. This is the program interface. So, it's just a class, K. It has, uh, it has two uh, type arguments, and then it has these two methods, id and compose. So, id uh, is a K from A to A. I'm going to read it that way, from A to A. Some of the intuition, so category. Uh, one of these category things, there's a domain and a range, that's what the two uh, type arguments are. And then we have composition. So if we know how to get from B to C and from A to B, then we get from A to C. Okay. So those, those are the, the two methods of category. A category is more than those two methods, it also has laws, three laws. Okay. So if you, if you have these two methods, but you don't meet the laws, you're not a category. Sadly, the type system has to isn't strong enough to check and tell you that it's not a category. So here are the three laws. The three laws are that the thing called identity, Mark? The same laws. The what? The same laws are. I'm sorry, I'm still not hearing. Oh, the same laws. Oh, really? Oh, what the the it? Oh, yeah. On the second line. On the second line, chat. Oh, the second law. G. Oh, the second law. G. 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 Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, would you write that down for me, Dave? Yep. <laughs> thank you. What was the other? Okay, yes, thank you. Right, absolutely. That's like one should say G composed id equals id. Good, that was my test to see who was paying attention. Clearly, <laughs> it wasn't me. Okay, so uh, so anyway, so the, the thing we call identity is an identity on the right and the left, and uh, compositions associated. Okay, that's all it means to be category. All right, so let's try it out. So remember, this is the linear map, the semantics, okay, from the representation to the meaning, and this is the semantic function. Okay, now. 
if we use the category abstraction, then I don't have to make up two names, id hat and a compose hat. I can use the names id and compose. So that's nice, I don't have to make up names. But um, the benefit is much deeper than that. Now, now the two, um, my specification, these two properties for id and compose, now look as follows. The meaning of id is id. The meaning of compose is compose of the meaning. That's a homomorphism. That's what they always sound and feel like. Okay? It's a kind of distributive property. The meaning distributes on the inside. It doesn't have an inside, so it goes away. Compose does have two insides, so the meaning goes there. Got it? That's what homomorphism could always look like. Okay? This is actually really important because this one statement here says we have no obstruction. So that's, that's a property we like. I'd like to have a non leaky abstraction. What on earth could I possibly mean by that? Could it be made precise? Yes, this is what it means. Is that the only way to not leak the abstraction? I always see that and I always go, it makes sense, but is that because like, it's the only one? So are you asking me, let's see, what are you asking? Is it the only I, one? I see how the second line doesn't leak the abstraction. Yes. Is it the only way not to leak the abstraction? So it, it, repeat that always. Okay, so uh, let me rephrase your question to see if it matches your intent. Um, if I violate one of these laws, do I necessarily have a leaky abstraction? Is that what you mean? Is that another way of saying only? Uh, is that the only way to formulate the two laws? Oh, oh, no. Okay. I could formulate these two laws a lot of different ways and they'd be equivalent. So it's not the only formulation, but it's the only meaning of the two laws. They're all okay. equivalent. I'll chew on that. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and maybe we'll talk and I'll find out I misunderstood you. Okay, so, yes. Sorry, once again, what's the difference between colon and an F20 symbol and just a symbol by itself? Great, thank you. What's the, what's the difference between these two things? This one is math, it's meaning. This one is, is representation. This is a data type in a program. So programs can only manipulate representations. They can't manipulate meanings. The programs don't apply them functions, pairs, integers, any of those things, they only apply to representations. And the reason we call them these representations integers is because they have they mean integer, they aren't integer, they mean integer, a pair, and so on. So this is the same thing. This thing is not a linear map. We might call it that. That's a common abuse of notation. That's a common sort of a shorthand in our expression. It's not a linear map. It's some representation in the program. But I think of it as a linear map without hurting myself because these properties hold. So you said that the thing on the left, CLS, that's yes. representation. That's a cap, that's, that's why it's a capital S. And that's, that's code. Yes. But then, and then, but then I'm looking at the thing on the right, I'm like, well, that's also code. Yeah, yeah sorry about and, that. And this is code, yeah. so. Yeah, sorry. So the thing on the right is not code, it's math. So this is not something we write in our Haskell program? Or exactly, is it? Nope. no. It's something you write in a comment. It's something you write in your documentation. It might be something you write in a uh, quick check test. If you bother to write a quick check test. Make sense? So it's the specification. It doesn't need to be executable. It so happens this is an executable specification, but it doesn't need to be. Okay, so you just happen to be using the same syntax yes. that Haskell does to yes. talk about a mathematical yeah, yeah. model. Yeah, and, and you know, that may be confusing, and I've heard that before. Um, and I apologize. Uh, maybe I could uh, express, use a different color. That might help. I use a different color. Say, mm -hmm. well, that also is code. The, the, the thing is, why is it so? Is it a coincidence that our math looks like our code? No, because our language is based on math, right? This would be less confusing in uh, Fortran because because Fortran it doesn't try to look like math. So. You know, I might say, hey, it's not my fault. Somebody designed the programming language that looks like my math. Did I just hear you say you should be doing something? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, but using another color or something would help. I'm sorry. Um, all right. So, so what? Oh, so now our construct, uh, by our correct by construct implementation looks slightly different. Okay. Just it's, now it's part of a, a category instance, and I haven't used made up names. But most importantly, the specification is this form. And over and over, what I, what I came to realize is that specifications should always have this form. If they do, I have, um, uh, I, I, I'm implementing an abstraction correctly. If I don't, it's, it's, a, it's not a correct or not a free abstraction. Okay. All right. Ah, 
for now, laws for free. So um, I heard a paper a few years ago, Phil Blogger uh, griped about my claim here that the laws were for free, but he really misunderstood. Um, he agreed he misunderstood. Um, so another way to say this is that the laws aren't necessarily for free, but they're already paid for. Okay. So anyway, you'll understand that maybe when I understand it. So what I'm claiming here is, is that this specification in this particular form necessarily implies that these laws are true. <laughs> Except for the second one. <laughs> okay. We have a certain proviso, which is that equality is semantic. So there's a question of what does equality mean? Right? This is parenthetically one of my gripes about the term IO monad. IO is, is like the only one of these things that we don't know if it's a monad. Because we don't even know what the question is. To say it's a monad is not even wrong because we don't know what equality means. But here we know what equality means, okay? And I'm suggesting equality is semantic, and that, that's critical. So two critical things, that equality is semantic equality, by which I mean two things are equal if and not if they're meaning they're equal. If that weren't true, it would be an abstraction that we shouldn't call that the meaning if, if equality doesn't feel inside. Okay, and this homomorphic uh, style of specification. So I'm gonna quickly go through a little proof. They're just incredibly simple. You can't get this wrong. So I'm gonna go through a proof that, uh, what, what the, this first law holds, okay? So remember, equality is semantic equality. So this law holds if and only if the meaning of the left-hand side equals the meaning of the right-hand side. So let's start with the meaning of the left-hand side, the meaning of id composed f. Well, by this specification here, it's equal to the meaning of id composed with the meaning of f. 